everyone. It's Emily Williams here. Welcome to the I Heart My Life show. I have an amazing episode for you today, especially if you're looking to create your own big talk and move forward with speaking in your business. So we have Trisha Brooke here. Trisha is an award-winning director, writer, filmmaker, and the executive producer of TEDx Lincoln Square. In addition to her work in the entertainment industry, she applies her expertise to the art of public speaking. She's written two musicals, a play, a sitcom, and a feature film. The documentary short she directed and produced, This Dinner is Fool, was the official selection at the New York Women in Film and Television Short Festival. She also hosts The Big Talk, a podcast on iTunes where she interviews people who talk for a living. So welcome, Trisha. So thrilled to have you here today. Thank you so much for having me, Emily. What an incredible introduction. Yes, you've done some amazing things, and we haven't had anyone who is so passionate about speaking on the show yet, so I'm just thrilled that the audience has a chance to get to know you and hear a little bit about all of your wisdom when it comes to speaking, because I know that's a lot, that's a big dream for a lot of people. I am here to make those dreams come true. (laughs) (laughs) I love that. So take me back. I really believe that everyone has their own I Heart My Life story, and I'd love to know what yours includes and how you got into this work in the first place. I would love to share this story with you, Emily. I'm a former dancer. I moved to New York City to pursue a career in dance. I'm also from the Midwest, like you, and had an amazing career as a performer on stage in front of the camera and transitioned into directing and writing was producing my own shows, writing my own work, and a friend who was a fan of my work said, I'm doing a TEDx in Syracuse and I need your help. And I thought, how fun would that be? It's just like directing a one-woman show. So I worked with her on the script. I helped her analyze the script, create an arc and a through line, just like I would with any other script. And then we rehearsed together. I worked on blocking. We worked on intention. We worked on when to be still and when to move. And she had this incredible experience. And it was so inspiring to be able to work with someone who had such an important message. So I was inspired every day going to work on this talk with her. So afterwards, she planted this seed. She said, you're really good at this. You should do this. And I thought, do what? (laughs) This is what I'm doing every day with actors. And she said, no, with speakers. So that's when I started the big talk. I had zero credibility in public speaking. I had zero online credibility. I did not know what an opt-in was. So I created this team to help me do the the behind-the-scenes things so that I could get in front of the act in front of the speakers and the actors so my I heart my life moment was when I realized that I could organically transition into helping speakers take stages and become who they are meant to be on a stage and that was so inspiring and fulfilling to me I just love the work that I do and it's different than working with actors with actors it's all about them <laughs> with speakers It's all about the message. So if I can help somebody get their message out there to change lives, it is why I get up in the morning. What an amazing journey. And I think that's so important, that differentiation right there, because I know when I saw Elizabeth Gilbert speak on Oprah's stage for her Live Your Best Life tour, she said that exact same thing. She said she was so nervous. She didn't know how she was going to do this. But then she started to realize it had nothing to do with her. Her mission was to share her story and her message. And that was what she had to focus on. And truly, that was one of the ways she overcame her stage fright was by focusing on the audience and who was watching instead of on herself. Absolutely. The fear is there because you're meant to speak those words. So if you can embrace that fear and and move through it and get to the other side, which is that very important message that you have to share, that you have to absolutely share with your audience, then it's worth it. That's true because the fear wouldn't be there unless it's a big message and unless it's something that you're meant to do. It's the same thing with starting a business and everything that I say to all of my entrepreneurial clients. That's such an amazing point. 
So before we dive into some of the specifics around how someone can actually do this, I want to know a little bit more about your own journey. And so you said you started off in dance and working with actors, but tell me a little bit more about potentially your childhood or even as a teenager. Did you always know that you wanted to be in this world or in that world? Such a great question. Yes, I absolutely did. I was born ready to go to New York City. <laughs> I, I was born to be a dancer. I've always seen the world through movement. And so I went to school. I went to dance class. I went to college and got my degree in dance. And I moved to New York City when I was 20 years old, pursued my career, absolutely had a dream to meet and work with Barishnikov, which I did. And that was pretty amazing. And then once I got through that part of my career, I knew that as a kid, I always wanted to be a dancer. I knew I wanted to make a living as an artist, but it's really difficult to make a living as an artist. So without even knowing, I became an entrepreneur. I started a fitness company. And I knew that when I went on tour with my dance companies, if I let my clients go, they might not be there when I got back. So I thought ahead, if I can hire people to train them while I'm on the road dancing, I can make money while I'm dancing, and I can make money while, I'm, while my trainers are working with my clients. So I set that business in motion 27 years ago, and that fitness company is still going strong, and that has enabled me to maintain my performance, my art, my producing shows, writing shows, producing theater, and so I always knew that I was going to move to New York City and be independent, be um, an artist. And I I didn't quite know that I would own my own business, but I, I definitely knew that being a starving artist was not sexy. <laughs> no, not at all. And where do you think that comes from? Where does that desire come from for you? Did you have family members who had similar dreams or what do you think that, what's where does that stem from? I think I was ultimately, Emily, born with grit. I am extremely determined. I think outside of the box. I'm not afraid to fail. And I think that's one of my biggest, one of my best qualities is if I don't know how to do something, I'll still try and just ask people along the way. I don't wait until I have all the answers ever. I just dive straight in and figure out, figure it out as I go along. Yeah, that's obvious from your story, and I know a lot of people can relate to that. And that's one of my big missions is to really support women in no longer waiting for perfection, no longer waiting in general, because we're missing so many opportunities. And really, the clarity comes as you move forward and as you take action. So even if you don't know exactly what you want to do or how it's all going to play out, you just have to move forward and things start to fall into place. And you start to hear those little whispers, like I'm sure you have throughout the years, whether it's to start the business or to help people speak on stage or whatever it may be, and you get your clarity along the journey. Absolutely. And I love what you just said, Emily, those little whispers. You have to listen to those. Don't brush them aside. They are they are coming to you and through you. And it's important to acknowledge them so that you can offer the world what it is you have to offer. I think they also come through angels, like the woman who asked you to help um, with her own speech. And she told you, you should do this. And it wasn't even on your radar as something you could do or was possible. And then that led you in this direction. Absolutely. What a gift. Yeah. And so once you did start to help people with their own big talk, tell us how that unfolded. How did that all um, manifest into what it is now? Well, the first thing I did was my homework. I dove straight into the world of TED and TEDx and started learning everything that I could about Chris Anderson and Jay Harati. And I had been watching. For people who don't know. Absolutely. Chris Anderson is the executive producer of TED and Jay Harati is the executive producer of TEDx. Okay. And TED is the non-for-profit organization um, and TEDx is the community-driven um, like franchise of TED. Great. Thank so you. I dove into that world even deeper and I had always been obsessed with TED Talks. I watched them all the time, but I, I did not know the formula. I did not know what made a TED different from a keynote, so I got smart. I taught myself. I did my research. I did my homework. And then I began to 
realize as a writer, oh, I know how to do this. So how can I translate it to speakers so that they can do it too? Because writing a big talk is different than writing a novel. It's different than writing a blog post. So how can I identify those differences for my speakers so that they can feel ease when they begin the writing process? Because not only is getting on stage terrifying, that blank page is equally as terrifying. So I began to identify these unique differences and talk about them. And all of a sudden speakers started coming to me and they would share ideas and I would help them identify the one idea that I thought was the most unique from their point of view. And that's what I do as a director. I go into somebody's soul and I bring out who they really are and then reflect it back onto them. And that's what I began to do with speakers. So all of a sudden I was working with these incredible human beings who had these amazing messages and I had nowhere to put them. <laughs> and as a theater producer, I put on shows. So I thought, how do I put these speakers on a stage? Oh, I know, I become a TEDx organizer. <laughs> and that's sort of how that whole thing happened. There's so many pieces in there that I want to help kind of break down for all of my I Heart My Lifers listening. So tell us, what is the difference between the keynote and the TED Talk? A keynote is usually about 45 to 60 minutes long. There's definitely a call to action at the end. You always want to teach your audience something and potentially get them to uh, do something at the end. Buy your book, donate to a cause. A TED is a gift, not an ask. It's an idea, not an issue. And your hope is that the audience will adopt your idea as their own at the end of your talk. Mm, beautifully said. That makes total sense. And you said you go into someone's soul. So tell me, how would you even begin that work with someone? Would it be a matter of meeting them and just asking a bunch of questions? Or what does that look like? That's a great question because it really is clear and what I do is I go in for two hours with what I call an active listening session. And I do my homework on the speaker ahead of time. Um, but what's wonderful about this process is that most speakers have a very clear sense of what their idea is or what they want to talk about. And by the end of this active listening session, it's different. So I go in and I start with the simple, okay, what's your idea? What are you passionate about? And the answers that I get from my speaker leads me down a path that I continue down until at the end of these literally two hours, it's long and it's deep and it's vulnerable and it's dirty and it's amazing. I get to the root, the heart of the speaker's true authenticity and what it is they need to share with the world. And I'll give you an example. I was working with a speaker, the amazing Kristen Smedley, who had been speaking for 16 years about retinal disease. She had three children, two were born blind. So she was very passionate about this topic. She started a foundation. She spoke about it eloquently and passionately for 16 years. So she approached me and she said, I wanna do a TEDx. This was before I was an organizer. And I said, great, let's make it happen, manifest it. And we began the active listening session I asked her tons of questions. She was very, very clear on what to say and how to answer because she'd been talking about it for so long. And then she started getting naked. And that's when the real magic happened. And by the end of our active listening session, I said, Kristen, your talk is not about retinal disease. It's about how you learn to see the world differently through your son's eyes. Wow. And what That's was it right. like for her to hear that? It was pretty amazing. And uh, she's one of my favorite speakers ever. She's so passionate, so honest. I think I really resonate with everything you're saying. I haven't done my own big talk yet, so to speak. Um, but I think as entrepreneurs, we're so close to our story or anyone who's out there sharing a message. We're close to our story. We're close to our audience. We know what we want to share, but it often takes people reflecting back to really help us see like what those true specific gifts are. I know for me, I put a post up, uh, fairly recently, just basically asking what sort of book people would expect me to write. And it was so amazing to see the responses and to see what people really feel is, you know, is my 
my message and what my gifts are because sometimes we are so close to it that we can't really see the I guess the big the big thing that's inside of us right Amazing. Because there's something on the outside that everyone sees, and that's what I often share with my speakers is, this is this is what you are all about, but it started in here. So go back in here. Yeah. And in terms of getting vulnerable, so you said she got naked, and <laughs> we know that that's not literal, but you know, how did you start to kind of break down the wall or any of the barriers or really get past, you know, all of those perfected and practiced answers that she was initially giving you. It takes time. Yeah. And I do this with my actors. It's really important that I create a safe space for them. So I need to earn their trust immediately by being grounded, by creating a safe environment, simple things by showing up on time, by making eye contact, by really listening. And I'm a really good listener. So it creates that relationship pretty rapidly. And so the breaking down of the barriers is just me continuing to tear away the layers of that onion and to get to the real center of what's happening and what the belief system is of the person in the room with me. Yeah, I can relate to that. With our clients, I always think that it's, um, I don't know if I want to say one of my goals, but I'll say that anyway, is to make people cry. Because in our (laughs) programs, it's not like it's surface level work. A lot of people are there to build a business, but it's so deep and it's something that's so personal to them and they want to have an impact. And really in order, in my opinion, in order to sustain success, you have to create a strong foundation. And that starts with your mindset and your big why and why, you know, what really drives you to do this work and that connection. And then to connect with your audience requires a level level of vulnerability and so you do have to go deep and you can't stay on the surface otherwise people are going to forget about you and it takes time to build that and for people to feel like they can open up and to really understand what their unique message is and what part of their story is really going to resonate and then it takes even more time you know for them to craft that message and be confident to share that with the world Exactly. It's exactly the same process. It's about putting yourself out there, not worrying about everybody judging you. And then the second part is the getting on the stage part. That's even more terrifying. (laughs) Let's pause here for a second. I want to talk about getting on the stage because I know a lot of people are feeling that fear and they're wondering, you know what, how could I ever do that? How could I ever overcome that? Or how could I live with it and still take action? So I want to talk about that after the break. So I'll be right back with Trisha Brooke. Do you want to learn how to make and attract more money in your business? If so, my iHeartMoney Live program is for you. It's a 10-week program where you can jump in, learn all about money mindset, how to transform the way you think about money, your relationship with money, and in turn, make more money in your business. So if you're interested, go to iHeartMoneyLive.com. Hey everyone, it's Emily Williams. We're back with Trisha Brooke on the I Heart My Life show. And before the break, we were talking about fear, specifically that fear that comes from this big desire to wanting to want to speak on stage. And there's probably a lot of you listening who have that desire and wonder how in the world you're actually going to be able to make it happen without maybe throwing up or passing out. <laughs> so I'd love for you to share your wisdom and your experience, Trisha, with everyone listening. How does someone move past that initial stage fright? It's such a great question and it's really, really difficult. The, and I want to own that and honor that. I don't want to say, oh, it's no big deal. You should just do it. It's, it can be paralyzing. So my suggestion for everyone watching is that you must start with one step at a time. If you think about the fact that you've talked with your friends around a dinner table, you've told a story, that's one step. If you think about conversations you've had with your spouse or your partner, that's one step. If you think about when you're talking to colleagues about things that you need or want to do or collaborations, that's another step. If you acknowledge the conversations and the stories that you're telling and having in everyday life, that will give you the first step of confidence. When you begin to speak in front of people, the first thing you have to do is create mild stress for yourself. And so if you want to I always say, read a fairy tale in front of your family. Get up in front of them and and tell a story in front of your family. Family is mild stress. And then you want to increase that stress. 
Give a talk in front of your colleagues. Increase the stress even more. Give a talk in front of a small conference or sit on a panel. The more you do this, the more you will know what to do when your body betrays you because you will get sick to your stomach. You will start sweating and you will have a dry mouth. <laughs> That's gonna happen physiologically because of nerves. So if you know how to deal with it, when that happens, you'll be able to move past it and through it much quicker. And I was on stage for many, many years. I always got nervous. But the moment that you walk out onto that stage, accept the gift from the audience before you give them yours. They are there to support you. They are there. They want you to win. And so if you can remember that and that your message is going to change somebody's life in that room, you can get past it. What a beautiful way of thinking about it. And I love all the parallels between your work and my work because I say the same thing. Fear is going to come up. It's kind of like Elizabeth Gilbert. She's coming up a lot today. But it's about, you know, in her book, the which, what is her book? Um, Big Magic. She talks about taking fear along for the journey. It's in the car with you. It doesn't get to control the radio or dictate where you're actually going, but it's there. And the quicker you make peace with it, you know, the easier the journey will be and, and the more action you'll continue to take. So I think that's so true. It's when we think that it's going to go away or that if it's there, then there's something wrong with us. That's when we get into trouble and we don't move forward. Absolutely. So for someone who isn't able to work with you personally, I know we're going to share a few ways in which people can contact you and, and follow you online. But for those of us who want to do our own big talk, but we have tons and tons of ideas, how do we narrow it down to that big message we're meant to share? That's a great, a great question because I think many people become paralyzed because they have too many ideas. So one thing that I do with my clients is I ask them to qualify each idea. Is it fresh? Is it unique? Do you really love it? Does it light your fire? And if none of those are yes, cross it off the list. Um, are you an expert at that idea? I love gastronomy. I love crazy science food stuff and the food network, but I can't talk about food. I'm not a chef. I'm not an expert in that field at all. Is it passionate for me? Yes. Am I an expert? No. Cross it off the list. So once you have this list of ideas and you really get honest with yourself, am I an expert? Do I have credibility in this? Am I passionate about it? You will find that those ideas will start to whittle down and you'll get really close to the one that you're most afraid of talking about. That's the one I want you to circle. Oh, goodness. The one you're most afraid. I'm just thinking in my mind about what that would be. I love that. So is there anything that you haven't spoken about that you're scared to put out there? Personally? Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's really interesting. I do want to speak about something that is very personal. And it is about mourning the loss of my single self when I got married. That's something that I'm, I'm really cultivating as far as a big talk goes. And Elizabeth Gilbert comes up again. Her second book is what I read on my honeymoon, and it's all about not getting married. <laughs> I read that too. Not on my honeymoon, but I've read it. Yeah. Amazing. So, I, so that was something that was, was difficult for you, or what was that experience like? Well, the, the experience was, who am I now that I'm married? What does that mean? How do I define myself? Can I still be funny? Can I still be sexy? Uh, what does Mrs. mean to me? I was an independent, single, successful woman for a long time. And now all of a sudden I'm somebody's wife. I couldn't figure out how to do that. And I couldn't figure out how to live in that and be that. And it has nothing to do with how much I love my husband. We are happily married eight years later. But it was a strange sort of, who am I? And how do I be this now? I spent a year not calling him my husband. I would just say, this is Joe. <laughs> so that's a talk I'm going to give. Oh my gosh, I can't wait to hear that. And I think a lot of people will relate to that on many levels, especially as a driven woman. I know for me, 
running this business and starting it and then James, my husband, coming into the business, that was weird. It was like I had to give over some of my power and like trust him and then I was kind of his boss and that's just a weird dynamic and people don't teach you how to do that. So I know I want to write something about that when I maybe have it a little bit more figured out. <laughs> um, but I think that dynamic, especially for us today and us wanting to be independent and wanting to you know, have these big dreams fulfilled and kind of like sometimes wanting to do it on our own and not always having that, you know, massive support there in a certain sense. Um, it's an interesting path to navigate. It's very complex. Yeah. So I think that's great for all the I Heart My Lifers listening right now. Think about that talk that would really scare you and the thing that you're an expert at or in and the thing that drives you and you're passionate about and that you really feel called to share with the world. So once someone has that topic, especially for those people listening who maybe don't have a platform yet, um, don't know how to even say book their TED Talk or land that opportunity, what do you recommend? I think if you know you have an important message, the first thing is to start talking about it. Start talking about it on social media, start talking about it when you email, and really get familiar and comfortable and passionate about this idea. And then start identifying TEDx events that you are interested in. For example, my event is very theatrical. I call it theatrical academia. I have Broadway performers coming and singing, and I have a magician opening the show because the theme is called Looking Beyond. He's going to perform an illusion. So that's my event. It's very theatrical. And I also think outside of the box. Somebody applied this year who was doing a talk about how air guitar can change somebody's life. I love that sort of thing. Wow. TEDx Cambridge is very academic. It's much more subdued than my event. And then there's TEDx in Aruba. So if you want to go to an island, you can do a TEDx in Aruba. Start searching for TEDx organizers and events. Get to know how they produce and then email them. We love to have you reach out. We want to hear from you. I had somebody reach out to me a year prior to this event that's coming up on March 27th. And he was just throwing me ideas and he was very nice back and forth. And he created a relationship with me and I asked him to take my stage. He applied like everyone else, but because he took the effort to get to know me and what it is I wanted, he specifically wrote a talk to meet my needs for my event. So if you have an idea and you really want to get your message out there, a TED stage is a great place to start because you get massive credibility right away. You can find an event that fits you, a salon, TEDx women. You can really find that one that makes you feel safe so that when you first take the stage, you've got all the support you need. That's interesting. So in terms of making you feel safe, what would that look like? Well, with my speakers, I make them feel safe by taking them from point A to point B. I guide them all along the way. I give them structure. I need to see your outline on this day. I need to see your first draft on this day. I need to see a video of you on this day. So I give them feedback. I give them confidence. I make sure they understand I believe in them. I love what they're wearing and that they're going to be lit well and have excellent sound. So I create a safe journey for them along the way. And on the day of the event, I create a quiet zone. So the green room has a quiet zone sign on it so that all the speakers can be respectful of one another. I create a community. Nobody's more important than anyone else in my event. All 12 speakers are incredible human beings and have equally incredible messages. So that's the kind of safe space I create for my event. I love that. That's amazing. I'm sure a lot of people listening will really be excited to hear that as well. And it's so interesting to me because I don't know much about TEDx. I don't know much about your event yet. Um, And so how often do you have the 12 speakers come and have these event days? TEDx Lincoln Square is once a year and it's in New York City and we have a theater that holds 130 people so it's a very intimate event. Last year we had 10 speakers and this year we have 12 because I couldn't give up two. (laughs) I love it. And so what do you look for in a speaker? I look for, first of all, it's about the idea. If you are pitching me your business or your book, 
it's not going to work because that's something that's not really from the heart. And we talked about that a little bit earlier. It's got to be it's got to be you. It's got to be your idea, something that could potentially have a global shift. So I look for ideas first. Then I look for uh, passion. And then I look for, honestly, if you're nice, because I spend nine months with you and I want to know that you're easy to work with, that you can meet deadlines, that you're creative, that you're, that you're, that you can take direction and you're willing to adjust. So I really love working with speakers who are malleable, just like actors. And what happens over the nine months? I had no idea that this was such a huge process. I'd love for you to share. Sure. Well, we open the application process up in September and then we choose the speakers in December and through September and December, there's a callback process, which is a video. So you're getting feedback from me along the way. And I read every single word in every single application. I was on the other side of the table for many years and I give full and complete respect to anybody who takes the time to apply to my event. So once we get the callback in, the videos, then Jamie Broderick, my co-producer and I, we go through everybody's videos and we, we start to determine, okay, what's the lineup? Diversity is very important to me for the speakers and the ideas. And then I cast the show. And then we announce in December and between December and March, the speakers start to work on their talks and they send me a, a blueprint. They send me a first draft. They send me an outline. They send me clips of them talking and I'm constantly giving them feedback and a making sure that they're staying focused on the idea they submitted with and B that they don't end the talk twice. You know, if it's got to wrap up, it's got to wrap up. So I'm really there to support them so that they have the best possible journey before they take the step onto the TEDx stage. And how much time do they have for their, their talk on the actual day? This year I had to limit everybody to 14 minutes because I chose two extra speakers. 18 minutes is the, is the maximum for a TED or a TEDx, but Chris Anderson says 12 is the new 18, and I totally agree with that. 12 minutes. Oh, my gosh. That's so short. And so can you tell us a little bit about maybe what the breakdown of the structure of the talk would look like? Like, are there different segments or different um, kind of chapters? Absolutely. You definitely want to open with an interesting open, and that could be a tease just like in Jaws, you don't see the shark until <laughs> midway through the movie. <laughs> I heard that that was not meant to happen. I heard that the actual shark, it wasn't really ready. And so they had to kind of modify what they were planning to do. And that happened organically. It absolutely did. When yeah. they're when the shark is pulling the, uh, the oil tanks in the yeah. water, that was because the shark wasn't ready and yeah. it's much scarier. I love that. So a tease is a great way to open a talk. Um, and then you want to dive into first, this is something that I use in theater. You want to give the audience the opportunity to understand what's going to happen so that they can relax. If you don't know what's going to happen, you're constantly waiting for it. But if you say, this is what's going to happen, and I don't mean, I'm going to tell you these things today. You want to give the audience an understanding of, I'm going to have music in my talk, or I'm going to use slides. You want to inform them what to expect so they can relax into it and then really hear what it is you're saying. So you start with an, a strong opening. Then you move into the complex in the complex points of what you're trying to share and communicate, no more than three. And then you want to wrap up with a nice close that potentially has a call to action. It potentially, potentially is a, a lyrical bookend. So if you open with an image, you might want to close with an image. If you open with a story, you might want to close with a wrap up of that same story. So Storytelling is key here as well. You want it to be conversational. You want it to be storytelling. That's another difference between a keynote and a TEDx. And when you say that there would be some sort of call to action, do you mean some sort of inspirational call to action? Because I know you mentioned, I yeah. Absolutely. You're not going to ask them to opt in or buy your book. Yeah. You're going to inspire them to think differently or potentially adopt this idea as their own and go out into the world and share that message. Amazing. And so how would you say someone would, I guess, gain speaking um, experience? I know you mentioned reading in front of your family, but is there something, is there a step before TEDx that you recommend people take? 
Yeah, absolutely. I think that if you can find some small conferences, some panels that you can get on, start getting out in front of people, go to an event and just be in front of people and communicate. It's terrifying. It's so scary. But when you start to do it, you'll become more and more comfortable with it. And what you'll start doing is forgetting to judge yourself. You'll stop judging yourself. And it's not that you stop judging yourself. You'll become distracted and you'll forget to judge yourself. Mm, Forgetting to judge yourself. I think that judging ourselves, it's a habit. I remember hearing Mel Robbins say that anxiety is just a habit of worry. And so if we can think think of judgment in that way, like it's a habit that we can break the more and more that we practice, that's so powerful. Beautiful. Well, I want to pause here just for a second and we'll come back after the break and talk a little bit more with the amazing Trisha Brooks. So I'll see you in just a second. Want to be the first to hear when new episodes of the I Heart My Life show are released? Go to iheartmylife.com right now and click on become a member. When you enter your name and your email, you'll also receive a free gift from me called Scared or Rich, Seven Practical Biz Tips to Moving Past Fear and Hitting Your Mega Money Goals. Hey everyone, it's Emily Williams and this is the I Heart My Life show and we have Trisha Brooke here with us today. So we've been talking all about TEDx Lincoln Square. She runs the amazing event there every single year. We've been talking about what it takes to become a speaker and design your big talk. But I know there's a lot more that Trisha is doing now, especially uh, within her work with entrepreneurs. So Trisha, I'd love for you to share a little bit about the documentary filmmaking that you're doing with entrepreneurs like me. I would love to, Emily. So I, I realized that I was putting speakers onto a stage and helping them share their message, but I'm also a filmmaker and I thought, well, how can I get speakers, entrepreneurs on the big screen? And so I do the same thing with my entrepreneurs when I'm shooting a documentary on them. I spend a solid day or two with them, getting to know them, getting into their heart so that I can shoot who they are. And what's happened in my experience with these documentaries is that shooting who you are and telling your story organically drives business to you and it organically increases your business because people see who you are. So I approach these documentaries very much like a filmmaker. I'm not video, I'm not creating a branding video for you. Um, One of the documentaries that I created is called This Dinner is Full and it's been in all of these film festivals. So Chris Shembra has a company called The 747 Club and he has created a business model around serving people dinner and creating empathy and compassion around the table. And I thought that is so interesting. Let me shoot a doc on this. So I spent a day with him and we shot this short documentary. I created this film and now this film is doing the the festival circuit. But what's incredible is he was never able to express what he really does. You had to go there in order to understand it. And now He can just send this film to people. So I was able to capture what he does by showing who he is. And that's what I love about working with entrepreneurs, capturing who they are and organically it will drive business to you. It's pretty cool. I can definitely see that in my own experience. And even when I joined a program for the first time, I remember watching this four part video series. It was more branding, I guess, but it was following this coach around her journey through Paris and talking about her story and just like, you know, literally being that fly on the wall for a few days in her life. And the message really, really spoke to me. And again, I I believe that it's all about showing people what's possible and that's what story can do. And it's not about us. It's about the message and about serving others. And so I love, love, love that. And you've been nice enough to send me um, one of your other documentaries um, with a woman who runs a similar business to mine. And all of that is just, it's so beautifully done. And I really think that people do get a better understanding of your work, especially in a field like coaching or something that can feel a bit more ambiguous. If you can just send that out, you know, it it can only help. Absolutely. And it's sometimes it's difficult for us to talk about ourselves. And if you can have somebody else show who you are, and there's a difference between showing who you are and telling us who you are. And that's where we really respond viscerally. 
Oh, I agree completely. And like you said, in terms of creating that big talk for someone, if you can kind of get an idea of what sets this person apart and you can show it visually, that makes such a difference than them just talking about their work and trying to express it in that way or via email or whatever it is. Um, that's It's really, really powerful. Thank you. In terms of the entrepreneurs you work with, I know we've talked about fear, but I'm just thinking about myself in terms of the first video series that I created. And literally, it was the hardest thing I've ever done. I was so nervous. I put so much pressure on myself. I wanted it to be perfect. I wanted my hair to be perfect. I wanted everything to be perfect. And it turned out well, um, but still, like, it was so hard for me to watch these videos. Even today, I find it really difficult to watch them back, and I don't even want to put them out there anymore because I feel like they're dated. So what would you say to someone like me who has such a big hang-up around, like, video, I guess it would be? I would say first, everyone else is going to judge you, so you don't have to. (laughs) So that's the first thing. We can stop judging ourselves because everyone else is going to. The other thing is we're all uncomfortable looking and reflecting back. It's really important to go back to that message, Emily. It's really, it's all about the message. And it's also about practice. Get yourself in front of the camera. When I'm working with actors who have yet to be in front of the camera, I get all up in their face so that they're really uncomfortable and they're really nervous before we roll because that's a third character that they have to ignore. And most people's eyes go right to the lens. So it's really important to practice, to let go of any desire to be perfect because perfection is not interesting. The message is what's really important. And if we can trust that getting into somebody's heart is through intimacy, vulnerability, and imperfection, because then they relate to us. So I love what you just said, and I want everyone to hear that again. Perfection is not interesting. So how do you support women especially in moving past their quest for perfection and really helping them to consistently remember that it's about the message? I think when I walk into a room, I'm perfectly imperfect. And that gives them permission then to also live in that space with me. And... I am, I am all about support and lifting up women, making sure they understand that what they have to say is so valuable, so important, and that the doors we walk through, we can build. We can build the doors we walk through, and that's what's important to remember, is that barriers, doors that are not open to us, no. Build the door and walk through it. Beautiful. So in terms of people and and creating their big talk, I love you shared earlier with me um, that one of your missions is to help people get their big talk off their bucket list and put it on their to-do list and actually do it. So when someone gets an opportunity to be on your stage or have one of these documentary films made, what do you see are the results from putting themselves out there like that? Such a great question. And it's it's kind of it is incredibly inspiring to me. Kristen Smedley, who I spoke of earlier, she did TEDx Lincoln Square in its inaugural year last year, went on to speak at the FDA and get funding for retinal disease. So that's kind of incredible. Yeah. (laughs) Mari Carmen Pizarro, who also did TEDx Lincoln Square, she went on to land two six-figure deals because of all the research she had done for her talk prior, so she was super ready. The credibility is also that something that is is having the TEDx crown creates instant credibility, no matter what event you're at. There's also the potential of more people hearing your message because it lives on TEDx YouTube channel. The entrepreneur docu series that's something that's really fascinating because we were talking a little bit on break. You can send it and not have to say anything. So it piques somebody's interest in a very unique way. And I think it's very different and it, it makes you stand out because you're, you're not sending a branding video, you're sending a film. And how many of us are in film? Very few. So if we can create 
a unique point of view. And that's what I do with my speakers. I help them create a unique point of view on stage. And with my docu-series, I create a unique point of view of those entrepreneurs for film. I love that. Thank you for that. And in terms of you and your own life and your own career, what are you most excited about over the next year or so? I am super excited about launching a new course so that I can feed as many people possible who are hungry to get onto big stages. I believe your story is important, so I'm super excited about that. I'm super excited about shooting a new documentary series called The Culture of Leadership. And I'm also really excited. I'm shooting a doc on um, the new chaplain at Rikers Island, who's a Buddhist. And he's working with the inmates and he's working with the corrections officers on how to hold space when you are living in such a violent place. Wow. How did that come to be? I was reading a magazine about this new chaplain and I found him on LinkedIn and I said, can you have coffee with me? I want to shoot a documentary on you. And he said, yes. Wow. Yeah. What an incredible role that you play in so many people's lives and you get to experience so many amazing stories. I mean, you must love everything that you do. I love every second of it. It's so amazing to be able to help people tell their stories, to help people find their truth. That's really what I do. And it's finding their truth and then lifting them up gently and setting them down onto a stage or helping them find their truth and just capturing it when they're not paying attention. That's magic. Mm, I love that image. So tell us, one of the things I love to ask every single guest on this show is how you've been able to create a life that's better than your dreams. I have created a life better than my dreams because I get to witness people becoming who they're meant to be every day. I get to come home to the most incredible husband in the world every single day. I live in New York City, which is full of art and diversity, culture, the most amazing food. I have an incredible life that I would never exchange for anyone else's. And how do you think people listening could at least try and get a little bit closer to everything you just described? What are some of the steps you recommend people take? First, you have to get really honest with yourself. What makes you happy? Because what makes you happy is not what makes me happy. And if you try to be someone you're not, or some, if you try to be somebody who you think other people want you to be, you're never going to get to that place of contentment. And happiness is not necessarily the same as contentment. So if you can trust that it's your journey that you need to be on and stop trying to be on somebody else's journey, you will find all of a sudden the world will open up to you. So it starts, Emily, with getting really honest with yourself. Yeah, I agree with that completely. And I think so many women especially, they have these big desires, but they're either denying them or they're worried about what people are going to think. And as you've said throughout this segment, people are going to judge you regardless, whether you go for your dreams or not. So you might as well go for them and make yourself happy. And like you said, it's, it's very unique. I believe that our desires are dropped in and they're there for a reason. And it's up, us to up, us to up excuse me, us to, up to us, <laughs> to, um, to follow that and to really live it and believe that, you know, everything that we do desire is possible for us. That's right. So final question, I'd love to know how people can find you, in particular, this amazing course that you're creating. How do we learn more about that? You can find me at thebigtalknyc.com. You can email me too at trisha at thebigtalknyc.com. And if you are interested in diving deeper and learning more about the course, I'm going to give you a free ebook and it's thebigtalknyc.com forward slash start. And it's all about supporting you starting this process of writing a big talk. Thank you. I know everyone's so grateful. And to all the I Heart My Lifers listening, I hope today has inspired you to create your own big talk. I think more than anything, Trisha, you've showed us what's really possible and made it seem really 
manageable to move forward and to figure out what we're meant to say and what we're meant to share with the world and given us some really easy steps to take to apply to TEDx or at least get started having those conversations and sharing in front of our family or at a party and taking those little steps forward and then eventually the bigger ones. So thank you for that. It's my pleasure. And for everyone listening, remember you too can create a life that's better than your dreams. You just have to start to take action, follow your heart, and move forward today. So until next time, I'm Emily Williams. I'll look forward to seeing you on the next episode of the I Heart My Life show. Thanks for tuning in. Be sure to follow me on Facebook and Instagram at I Heart My Life Now. And did you know, I'm on the radio every single day. Visit americaoutloud.com to download the talk radio app so you can tune in at 8 a.m. Eastern and 1 p.m. GMT.